Hi, Climate Leaders. We're here to do three things. Drive the energy transition, prevent future climate change, and also deal with all the impacts of climate change that are here already. And along the way, as we deal with these complex systems in the world, of course we see all of these different interesting compensating effects, balancing effects, and sometimes effects that drive change that we never imagined possible. Those are the kind of things we're going to look at in this video today on balancing loops. Activists push in one part of the system, but then the system pushes back and somehow undoes the change. Or a steady effort gets compensated for by things in the system we never really imagined. Or we tap into information flows that somehow bring about change we never imagined possible. We call these effects balancing loops, and they're contrasted with reinforcing loops, which are being handled in another video. This video is going to bring you two things, intuition and insights into the ways that balancing loops show up in the energy and climate system, how they help us, how they push back on what we do. And second, this video is going to bring the basic mechanics of a really important building block of systems thinking. It will bring how we draw them, how we identify them, and the important icons we use when we capture them in diagrams. I discovered the field of systems thinking by experiencing a very strong balancing loop. When I was in college, I organized 120 students and faculty and deans and myself to carry around our trash in clear plastic bags. You see, I was really concerned that we were focusing too much just on recycling and using stuff again once we'd already consumed it. But I thought, really, how do we draw attention to the fact that we're using too much in the first place? And the real leverage is probably not on disposing of our waste, but using what we use and we consume. So I had this idea. When we carried our trash, we carried it everywhere to parties, to class, to our dorm room, to the gym, all over campus. We put in everything we used, pizza boxes and beer cans and junk mail and old term papers and plastic forks and paper napkins, all the stuff that we used. And as we used it, things got bigger and bigger, day one and day two and day three. We were supposed not to change our behavior at all, but over time, it became impossible to do that. You would do anything to avoid using stuff. So people started carrying around a plastic coffee mug and silverware and a bandana in your pocket instead of a napkin and canceling junk mail and reading the newspaper, not at your dorm, but in the library. We drank beer by the keg out of principle. It was amazing how it changed our behavior. It was like going around with a different set of glasses on as we saw the world, trying to avoid using more stuff at all times. In systems thinking language, we closed a feedback loop that had previously been open. We created a balancing loop. Previously, there wasn't a way to throw things to. Things would just disappear. Suddenly, we felt the implications of our actions in this idea of a balancing loop. And what we're going to do next is show you how we would diagram that and how it fits into the icons of systems thinking. Increasing the use of disposable materials increased the rate of adding stuff to the bag, which increased the size of the bag. As the hassle of carrying the bag increased, and trust me, it was a hassle, pressure to use less stuff that produced trash increased. All else being equal, that lowered my use of disposable materials. In this way, simple information feedback received powerfully and viscerally changed my behavior. It worked. As climate leaders, consider how we might do the equivalent of carrying our trash when it comes to carbon emissions, somehow showing people the effects of their actions. We know of two experiments. One video showed black balloons to represent carbon emissions from energy use in many parts of our lives. What a great idea for creating feedback where there was none. And another at UMass Lowell where a student carried a backpack 
with the weight of the average American's daily carbon dioxide footprint, which is about 100 pounds. 100 pounds of carbon dioxide is a lot when you feel it and don't just think about it. So now I'm wondering, are there other types of information feedbacks that would lead us to lower our emissions and transform this economy to address climate change and deal with its impacts? What kind of feedback could be out there? The example is the way that society deals with global climate change challenge overall. Let's start with our first variable. There it is, greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions from burning coal, oil and gas, and from changing land use, and other gases like methane and N2O and the F gases. This is a good variable name because it can go up or down, and it's clear. Greenhouse gas concentrations is our second variable. This represents the accumulation of gases in the atmosphere. This arrow means that the first variable affects the second, causally. Note, they're not just correlated, moving in the same direction. One actually causes the other. Emissions cause changes in concentration. The plus sign means that the second variable changes in the same direction as the first. More emissions, more concentrations, all else being equal. But the plus doesn't, only, doesn't just mean up. It just means in the same direction. So if we have less emissions, all else being equal, we would have lower concentration. Let's keep going around the circle. Greater concentrations, higher temperature. Then more heat added to the global system, we have more negative impacts. Droughts, extreme weather events, sea level rise, impacts on health, poverty. More negative impacts leads over time to concern about impacts amongst the people around the world through education, campaigns, and just observing what's going on. More concern leads to actions to reduce emissions, legislation, treaties, business policy, personal action, civil society campaigns. More actions, if they work, reduce emissions. Here we have a minus or negative sign. This means the second variable moves in the opposite direction as the first. There we go. That closes our first feedback loop. The emissions at one point in time affects the emissions in a future point. Now we can test it to see what kind of loop it is. We test the system. Imagine that emissions go up in one year. How does this play out around the loop? More concentrations, higher temperature, more impacts, more concern, more actions, and the actions lead to less emissions. If it starts out going up and it comes back around the loop going down, it has a balancing effect. It's a balancing loop. See how emissions started out going one direction and came back going the other? Balancing loops tend to counteract growth in systems. They drive behavior towards a goal or towards its long-term historic value. In this case, the mission of the climate movement is for this balancing loop to affect the business as usual curve, the orange line, which shows global fossil fuel emissions. If the balancing loop is very weak, then we are very likely to see a future like this orange line where emissions goes up and concentrations and temperature go up, this would be really bad. However, if the global climate movement is strong and if the balancing loop that we created is really strong, it will lead the growth in greenhouse gas emissions first to slow, then to peak, and then to fall following the second line, the red line, back, back, down, down, down. A strong balancing loop could bring this impact in the world. And really, you might say the mission of the climate leader is to make this happen so that we reduce future climate risk. Now I'm going to talk about the meaning of this loop. This is a very important loop, particularly for climate leaders, and particularly for climate leaders who may have times of feeling down or hopeless and disconnected from what we're really up to in our results. You and I are part of a very large feedback system in the world. It's much like the immune system of an organism. 
that's responding to a threat with organized action to deal effectively with that threat. All we need to do is deal with our part of the system, the part that we can affect, translating our perception of problems in the world, of the climate impacts, translating those into effective action that's actually going to reduce emissions and avoid the problem in the future. And then also to help us be more resilient to the changes that are already here. Sometimes balancing loops take the form of what we call compensating feedback loops. And these are ones that we should watch out for so that the positive effects of our actions aren't undone by them. In this next example, we're going to look at one kind of carbon dioxide emissions, that coming from burning oil, and some of the compensating feedback loops that can spring up. Say you want to address CO2 emissions by stopping drilling wells or pipelines. The strategy might look like this. Actions to limit oil production reduce oil supply, which reduce CO2 emissions. But compensating balancing loops can kick in and push back. For example, if oil supply is reduced in one area, because most oil fields don't operate at full capacity, the industry average for utilization is about 80 or 90 percent. It's possible for them to increase the capacity of other existing oil fields and compensate the supply. And restricted supply could increase the price of oil which unfortunately means that harder to get and so more expensive oil supply sources become more affordable. For example, tar sands oil extraction. Deep offshore drilling in many cases is only affordable when prices are over $90 a barrel. Less than that, it's just not worth it for oil companies. Drilling in these marginal areas increases the oil supply and undoes the effects of the intervention. We climate leaders must look out and just understand that there are these balancing effects in these complex systems. And more specifically, recognize that broader policies such as carbon prices avoid many of these compensating effects. Here's another example from my work at Rocky Mountain Institute on Western water issues. We were trying to increase the water efficiency effort in the United States. Shower heads, efficient toilets, in efficient industrial reuse systems and landscaping, things like that, to reduce the per capita water use in the United States, people using less water. The idea was this would increase the amount of saved water and therefore keep more water in the rivers. However, we found a compensating effect. The more saved water there was, therefore the more water that was freed up and made available for housing development, and thus the greater the population, thus compensating for the amount of saved water. This was a balancing loop that really undid some of the positive effects of all the water efficiency effort. So what was really needed was a law to dedicate some of the saved water back to the ecosystem to avoid this compensating balancing feedback loop. Overall, with that example with the Western water, I was so frustrated. It felt like I was just one part of the system, and I was looking at that one part of the system too closely and missed the whole, much like the elephant story we've told in another video. Now you have one more important part of your systems thinking language. Previous videos looked at reinforcing loops. Now you have the tool of balancing loops, and hopefully you can use them in your work. In your planning and in your strategy, watch out for these compensating feedback loops and try to act in ways to avoid or weaken them in case they push back on what you're trying to do. And remember that whenever you're acting on to address climate change, you're part of this huge global feedback loop with the Earth system responding to this challenge that it's facing. Remember you're part of it and that should give you some strength and some power. So let's go get them.